different then Niggas claiming that they with this shit Cut a different since I'm living it Boss DeVito was sir, you with your people My gang cop heavy like Bossy and that Pacino We let the loud and deep go If it the breeze, see notes Just know these young niggas gon' stay Chips like Primo oh, I done had fucked up days and bad nights bad night. It took a few L's trying to get my cash right All right, family, what's going on? I got my brother Sanab over here, over here from uh, Sankofa TV. He gonna come over here and give us a, a educational presentation on the reconstruction period, which is gonna be dope. Just some stuff that we didn't talk about uh, in the back chat. We've been, well, they, I ain't gonna say we, cause they've been doing a lot more studying than I have, but uh, I just, you know, I'm familiar with some of the things that he gonna that he's gonna present tonight. Uh, I ask that everybody hit that like button. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, what's going on with you, fam? Peace, big brother. How you doing? Appreciate you for having me on, man. Oh, you already know, man. You already know. Yes, yeah, uh, it, you know it's it's a shame <laughs> that you know certain things happen to like a, me and you was talking to my other channel and stuff because uh. We had already started doing some bills together, but the good thing that came out of that is that uh, you did start putting some stuff on your channel. That way we got more than one outlet to go to for information for the people. So I think that that's dope. So I advise everybody to go ahead and go subscribe, subscribe to his channel, uh, Sankofa TV. But, yeah, uh, most definitely. Um, definitely on those Nova Scotia bills. I know the channel got kind of flagged, so it kind of started a progression on that. But definitely, um, the bills, like the system, my name is Jay, PCJ, the squad, Gisela, Brother Joe. So we kind of had these bills, like you said before, in the back chat. Um, some relevant stuff to kind of get away from the the bull that we see, you know what I'm saying, on, on other video channels or platforms, ever how the people want to call them. But, you know, this this is not, I'm not here to be, you know, Professor Sineb or anything like that, but this is just to, have us start thinking about these time periods. We don't have to reach back all the way to West Africa, though that's a great thing for those who haven't done so yet, but we don't have to reach all the way back to Kemet. We have ancestors that's 100 years ago, 150 years ago that we can reach to and grab and get some uh, insight from and kind of use or improve on their tactics, build on and use them in our day and age that we in right now. So like I said, appreciate you having me on. Man. Oh, no doubt, no doubt, man. So basically, um, give us a little bit of uh, background on what, what you're going to be talking about. Well, this period right here is Reconstruction. Um, for those who don't know, Reconstruction period happened right after the Emancipation Proclamation this, and the Civil War ended. So you're talking about 1863. Um, I think the number is, you know, four million some Africans are now free. And the U.S. government, who's going through its own turmoil, is trying to find something, you know, find plans to handle all these people. And you are, and not only these people are now free, you're in hostile territory. Anybody understand war? You know, though our ancestors at that time who was in the deep south were in hostile territory. So with the Reconstruction period, there were some strides made. You get your important 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments from this time period. This all happened in like a 10, 12 year period. Um, right. Though some of those, you know, amendments had issues, um, you know, it still was a way to help the people at the time and they were utilized. So that's kind of what I'm gonna kind of build on. All right, for sure. Now, like, um... Let me see, like when we talk about the reconstruction period, like just g give me like the the years that we, you know, 
we're talking 1865 to 1877. So you got Lincoln, you got Lincoln sort of supporting the Freedmen's Bureau. A couple of days later, he popped in the head. He gone. So now you got Andrew Johnson, I believe, comes in, and he's and he's kind of dealing with it from that time period. So it was like I said, about a good 12, 10 year period that they, they consider Reconstruction. All right, and like, what what was what was they like when we talk about Reconstruction? You know, people think of like something being rebuilt. Like, was Reconstruction mm-hmm. period just for like uh, when we talk about this? We just talking about for blacks. Or was this the Reconstruction period for, like, the entire country? Well, it depends. Culturally, we would see Reconstruction period as our ancestors coming out of slavery and trying to find their way around uh, a country or a part of the country that didn't, that still wanted to be slaves. So that's trying to find employment, trying to find somewhere to stay. So it's that Reconstruction, the reframing of what the American society looks like. Okay. So... All right, well, go ahead and uh, start walking us through uh, your uh, presentation a little bit, bro. Okay, so like I said earlier, after the Civil War, you have what was the four million black folks who are now free. Uh, and they're free, and at this time, they don't have a job. They don't have nowhere to stay. They're kicked off their plantations. They don't have any food, so if they can't run down to Whole Foods and grab something to eat. Um, so they're trying to maneuver through, through this. So... During these times, you have something um, called the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau was enacted at, those, at that same time to deal with these large, this large population of Africans who are now, like I said, have found themselves free. Now, through this time with the Freedmen's Bureau, notably, you have your Howard University, your Hampton University, your Fish University, if I'm not mistaken, all were pretty much founded by individuals who supported the Freedmen's Bureau. So, with that being said, around the late 1860s, you see it's over 250 um, black delegates start to enter state legislatures, local legislatures, and over oh, to national legislatures. Uh, two of them brothers I, I sent you in the back chat, um, Hiriam Rebels, who was the first African American to serve in the Senate. Uh, he was representing Mississippi. Um, he didn't get to do a full term, but you know he still counts as that first brother to to sit in that chair. Now, also Blanche Bruce. Now, these two brothers are different because Henry wasn't born into slavery, but Bruce, uh, Blanche Bruce was. So let's let's kind of get that dynamic. Those guys came from two different backgrounds, but was able to come together and build and support the people. So again, like I said, 265 delegates you now have in these legislators and a hundred or so of them were former slaves so imagine that you go from being with you know the atrocity that we know happened on the plantation to now you're sitting side by side with the plantation owner so that's that's a little crazy dynamic right there right all um, right and also at the time a lot of these leaders started to spring you know again out of the black church i know a lot of people don't like to hear that but it's factual you know, a lot of these, these places. What you about to say, bro? I was about to. I'm gonna. I definitely want to touch on that. But go ahead. Well, I we can touch on it right now if you want to. Okay, okay. Because like when we talk about uh, black people in, in in general, you know what I mean, and the in the mm-hmm. black move, the black first movement. You know, a lot of people look down on the church and the churches did this and the church helped help brainwash us and you know all of the things you hear about the church. Um, what's some of the things that you can say about the early church in the way that it actually helped, um, uplift the black community? I mean, you, at a time you couldn't have a whole bunch of brothers and sisters outside politicking. You couldn't have it. Automatically red flags were starting to spring up from the, the overseer of the slave master. So there had to be a place where we can go to build amongst ourselves, whether it be the worship or whether it be just a plot to get our get our hind parts free. I'm not trying to cuss, so that's why I said hind parts for my country folks that's listening. We're trying to get free. So a lot of your political leaders sprung up out of the black church. It was a way for us to go have a meeting room to discuss politics, to build communities and organizations. On my show, on my channel, I'm Sanko for TV, I built on the Afro-American League and Council. The individuals who started those councils who dealt with those leads were out of the black church. You know, small institutions like penny savings banks. You couldn't go downtown to those European institutions and, and start no handle bank account. 
you couldn't if you if if your mama passed away, your grandma passed away, you ain't had the money to bury you. So that's and, and anyone who follows masonry, that's one of the core principles. Taking care of that widows and the widows' children. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So you got companies. Everywhere you saw a black church, you saw a community. Regardless of the ideology they were spitting in that building, everyone who was in that building knew their responsibility was to their people and they, to their community. So that's why you can have an Alexander Waters who starts the Afro-American League. And in their preamble, he says, regardless of what your ideology is, you can be a member of this organization. Now, though we don't see that in the black church today, the intent of the black church as an organization, I'm going to preach organization until I'm going away from here. The organization that the black church was able to set up, rules, you see what I'm saying? So, so, Electing certain individuals in the community. Go ahead, bro. Now I was going to say, so basically it wasn't all, because this is something that I, I think uh, Danny just said a few times too, like it wasn't all about worshiping or serving Jesus. It was actually no. some organizing you know, some planning and and some support no. going on within the church. I mean, for, for those who, who disagree, do the knowledge on the AME church and the AME Zion church. You know, Richard Allen, Alexander Waters, um, you talking about brothers who started something to build up communities. That's what it came down to. An organized body who, who everyone in that body had a role and a responsibility. It wasn't about, you know, falling out because Jesus, somebody touched your forehead, taking care of the community, starting businesses. And with this era right here in Reconstruction, you also see the, the makers of the men who would start these institutions like the AME Church and AME Zion Church. So if we can take the ideology out of the equation for a minute and just think about it. When you saw a black church, you saw a community, you saw businesses all owned by African people. You can't get around that. There's no way, you know, if you do, show and prove it. You know, I, I'm willing to debate that with anyone. When you saw a black church, you saw, I'm not talking about right now when you see a black church, you see a liquor store down the street. I'm talking about at those times, 18, late 1800s. Right. You, you saw black churches and you saw communities. So. Yeah, that's what's up. People got to let sad. that go. Yeah, because you get that a lot, you know, like all oh, the church then did this and that and that and this, but a lot of people haven't did the information. And what they're doing is they're basing their opinion of the church today uh, and not knowing what the church actually did in the past for the people, you know what I mean? So I think that's an important thing that, you know, those who have done the studying should uh, point out to the people. When they get a chance, every every time they get a chance to, man, I don't know how many times I'm sitting around talking about the AME church like I go to church. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of for me because I came up in it. My grandfather was a preacher store for 50 years. My grandma was a deaconess for 50-something years, so I kind of came up in it. Right. At the time, I saw what it was doing. Where I'm, where I'm from, goes to North Carolina, it's like a little community where it was. You know, a lot of people passed away and moved out, but it was a little village. You can eat no matter what house I was at. I can eat food, go to sleep, get a whooping. And then when I got home, I got another one for being disrespectful. You know, so I was we, I was in a little black community and I didn't appreciate it at the time as I appreciate it now, you know. Yeah. I think but, I think that this this conversation that you have in though is going to open a lot of people's eyes. Um, so go ahead. I'm going to let you go ahead and continue to build. Okay, so we, we were discussing the um, the Freedmen's Bureau. So the Freedmen's Bureau was instituted to kind of deal with, you know, the, the feeding, the medical aid, the housing of these now dispersed Africans, free Africans now. So now this group came with a little bit of opposition from the president at the time who felt like we, we was unfairly treating a certain population of the, uh, the community. So he actually vetoed. Um, it, it's initial establishment. Uh, Andrew Johnson vetoed it. Cause he felt like, oh, you're giving them uh, assistance that you wouldn't give uh, another white man assistance with, which is kind of strange because that white man just ain't come out of slavery. He has a house. He has a job. So um, then you start to get into, now as you have these uh, black folks now in the legislature, they're making laws, they're c combating segregation. 
Um, you see certain cases. I want to say it's eighteen. I want to say it's eighteen eighty three. But you see cases where they're arguing over train cars. Where you have men going before a courtroom saying, "Hey, listen, I want to be able to sit in those nice train cars. Why do I have to sit in these these dirty ones?" So then you start having, you know, your Fourteenth Amendment kicks in. Everybody know what the Fourteenth Amendment is. That's when you permission if you're born here, you a U.S. citizen. So now they cross that hurdle to where now you a U.S. citizen. Now you should be able to vote. But you know you have groups like the KKK and other angry white Democrats at the time who still didn't want you know black men vote because they were losing their their power base was going away. Mm -hmm. So you that, that anger there. So that's when you see a, a very large rise of the again of the KKK. Um, so you got these, I want to say is Ulysses S. Grant at the time, he came up with something called the Enforcement Act. Now these Enforcement Act was supposed to protect black people at that time. So if you don't know, those federal troops were still in the South during this time. So that's why you didn't they see that many rallies or, or um, issues going on because the federal troops was there to protect the people still. So, so basically, the fe the federal troops stuck around after after the war was over. Yes, that was one of the stipulations that you keep the troops there to protect the population of newly freed slaves. So later on, you start getting to the Compromise of eighteen um, eighteen seventy seven or eighty seven, and that pretty much sunk the ship because now with the Compromise of eighteen seventy seven. With the Democrats winning, one of the stipulations of them coming into the White House was they had to pull all the troops out of the uh, out of the South. Mm. So now that protection is still it is gone now. So that's when you start seeing towns burnt down and black people massacred because that protection level was there. And one of the comp the um, items in that compromise was the North wouldn't interfere with issues of the state. That's why the 14th Amendment was kind of, it was light. It was a light amendment because what it did, that's why you have situations where they could have segregation and say you can't go into the restaurant and eat because they can choose, that person is an individual. He can choose not to feed you. What the 14th Amendment said was no state or no government can segregate. Right. So pretty much anyone who challenged the 14th Amendment because you can't eat into it, go into a diner and eat. You can't use the 14th Amendment because it loses every time. And it's lost like that throughout history. Damn. But I, then we get to... You, go ahead. No, I was going to say, that 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 had to have been, been a rough time, like, coming... I mean, because uh, we ain't... Like, not saying... You know, we ain't saying that, or you ain't saying that all... Because uh, you mentioned uh, brothers that was free. So not saying that everybody was uh, in slavery... But for those coming out of slavery and those who weren't enslaved, that had to have been a rough time. Very rough period. And you're talking about, and we ain't even getting to the, the black codes or slave codes or what would soon out to be these uh, so-called Jim Crow. I think I sent you the picture of the Jim Crow before. Um, that's what kind of what they base some of the American style Jim Crow uh, caricatures off of. Mm -hmm. a dude named uh, Daddy Rice or whatever his name was. But you talking about now, just, just imagine you've been displaced. You've been kicked off a plantation. You don't have no job. You've got probably got four or five kids that are hungry. How are you going to feed these kids? So now let's say you want to go get a job. In states like Mississippi and South Carolina, you couldn't get a job that paid um, a very high wage. For instance, if you did, you may have to pay a fine between $10 and $100 for having a good job. And they will also have these things called anti-enticement laws. So, for instance, you work in at Sears. There's a better job at Walmart. Let's say Walmart offered you more money. It was illegal for you to take that job that paid you more money. Dang. Vagrancy laws. Every year, I want to say it's in Mississippi, if you was black, you had to carry around in your pocket where you worked at because they made it illegal for you not to have a job. And one of the punishments, if you get caught without that paperwork, was going right back to the plantation and work for free. Now, was this before, uh, like, the sharecropping thing went on? This was during the same time. Same and time. The, sharecropping, the sharecropping thing came about because you have these plantation owners with these very huge, large plantations and pieces of land that still need to be worked. 
Okay. And now that they didn't have free slaves to do it for them, they had to start hiring people. But when they found out they couldn't pay the people, they started saying, okay, guess what? I'm going to start sectioning off my land. So you get, like my great-grandfather my great grandfather was a sharecropper. You get a piece of land, you work that piece of land, and you pay a certain percentage back to the landowner. Wow. But some of the fees, some of the stuff you was able to grow, you kept that profit. So sharecropping was heavy during those times because even the plantation owners themselves couldn't afford. You talking about people who got at least four hundred good years of free labor from us, right? To build build businesses and companies, banks off the backs of our ancestors. Now they can't handle it no more. So we kind of it's a catch twenty two for us as as a free black man, black woman in America. You are gonna work a job, you're not gonna get paid no money. You're gonna be at the bottom. So now it just turned into a cash system. You at the bottom level, and you can't even elevate yourself, because if you do, you'll get fined, or they'll kill you. That's on the table as probably a second or a first option. Wow. So you got to understand the frustration when you start seeing black folks. Do you got that picture I sent you with South Carolina? Uh, yeah. Let me see. When you, see, uh... when you start seeing black folks in these legislatures who were, I would say, I was almost a hundred of them were slaves. That are you now sitting beside your slave master? So. A lot of those Europeans were scared. Can you imagine? I know for me, I can't really fathom it, being at that level, being enslaved into a couple months later, I'm free or so-called free. Uh, hold on, give me one second. I got it pulled mm -hmm. up. I just want to make it a little bigger so they can see it a little better. All right, so this is in uh, South Carolina. That's in South Carolina, yep. Uh, so you seeing, I mean, that's a lot of brothers in that picture. Yeah. And you got that, this is at the time when uh, black folks, we were Republican, which their intentions weren't to see us completely liberated. They was more worried about controlling votes. But at that time, they were an ally to us at that time. Republic, The Republican Party, the, the Democratic Party at that time was trying to, you know, throw us back into servitude. Mm -hmm. So, um, at that time as well, you ever heard the term carpetbaggers? Nah, nope. So carpetbaggers, they were called uh, northern whites who came down to the south and trying to take advantage of the political situation. Like, they call them scallywags and carpetbaggers. Now, I heard of the term scallywag before, but I didn't know it was, like, pertaining to, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know. Yeah, it's, 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 scala, it's Scalawag. That's what we call those individuals from the North who try to come down and take advantage. So, and and that's to, that's to say about some of our people who don't agree with being involved politically, you know, with elections. The changes that were being made during this period of time was taking that power base away from the white Southerners. As far as Laws that allow you to go to school, allow you to read. You didn't have to sneak off into some empty church to, to learn how to read. You were allowed to go to schools. This is before segregation now. This is when you, you can go to that school and learn. You can ride on that train car. But then as these states, because you already have a president who doesn't like this Freedmen's Bureau. He doesn't like this thing called Reconstruction. He's been put in office for a specific reason. That's to get, you know, we got to calm these, these blacks. We got to figure something out. So he, he was that president for them to try to force us back into servitude. So when you, after the compromise of 1877, you had this withdrawal of troops that protecting this population, you got other states starting to come up with their own version of black codes. So um, even though you may be elected an elected official because of intimidation by the KKK, you have now your vote is suppressed and you ultimately become disenfranchised. So it doesn't matter if you got uh, if hearing rebels or Blanche Bruce is in office, they vote don't matter. Dang. Because the people in their districts are scared to vote. Wow. So they get they basically being threatened if they do go vote. Absolutely. Sort of like what we see have, overseas. They, they got a, those black codes that brought literacy tests. Uh huh. So they would say, okay, well, you got to pass this. But for black folks, they had they didn't great-grandfather. For old whites, they got grandfathered in. 
because they would consider you as citizens at the time. Uh, That's how they try to spend it. For that for that free now black man and black woman, they had to take the competency test. Now you already told them they couldn't read for four hundred years. Now in order to let them vote, you're gonna tell them they gotta pass a literacy test. Right. Just another way to try to uh disqualify them from you know right, being a part of the process. Tax. Right. Poll tax. They don't have no money to pay no poll tax. And they knew that. But these old black holes that were able to be set up to cause they couldn't get us out of office. Or they would have to kill every one of us. So they found ways to work around the system to get to get their intentions done. Damn, man. And then you got the birth of Jim Crow, the separate but equal. So we got to understand the importance of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. All are considered Reconstruction period amendments. It was ways, that's why we have the chief of uh, staff saying that the Civil War happened because there was no, it was a lack of compromises. And that's foolishness. There was plenty of compromising going on. It just wasn't working out. And they, they saw us as property, not as human beings. And I think that's a story that needs to be talked about more. Because when people get on TV today and say, oh, well, there's things that happened back then that's not, that was acceptable. Yeah. It, it's never been acceptable to enslave a population, people who come from nations. That's kidnapping. Right, right. You, you feel what I'm saying? So... It's it's me, you, it's crazy, man. you know what I mean, and you know this, you know yourself, just from being around in the world. Like it seems like the same thing that we hear, people like you know politicians and just people who talk, talking about what's going on in other countries, they didn't actually already did to their own people, right here, or they didn't did it to people in their own country, right here in America. Like, Absolutely. Because like, when you talked about the the voting thing, I can remember when they were saying like, uh, is either Sunni or Shiite Muslims or some somebody like that was trying to stop people from voting. And I know like over in Pakistan, they had a young girl who was out. She was a, a activist, and they tried to assassinate her. You know what I mean? Because she was trying to help get people out to vote and you know. Uh, advocating against certain things over in Pakistan. You know what I mean? And they was ready yeah. to they was up in arms about that. But you know they didn't did the same thing. It's still suppressing people's votes hit right here in uh America. Absolutely. And for those who want a little bit more insight on what brother Marty is talking about, if you go to NBK New Black Knowledge, they got I think it's a two part series called All White Cast. And it will explain to you how Europeans did this to themselves first. Mm -hmm. They was beefing with each other. You know, Rome fighting the Franks, fighting the Goose, Scottish, Irish, they didn't like each other. Right. Due to not these Irish and Scottish folks, they were the original monkeys. Yeah. You know, due to knowledge on, they was the one in the characters having gorilla faces and being paraded around in zoos. All right, you know so I'm glad you said that. So at this time during Reconstruction, because um, I got Jim Crow up right now in the, you know, caricature of him. Where mm -hmm. where are the art? Because I know a lot of the overseers. I want to say, mm, I, I may be wrong, and you can correct me on that. But I know a lot of them, and then a lot of the people who was like uh, got into law enforcement and stuff ended up being Irish, right? Where did, where was right. these people, these Irish people, at during this time of Reconstruction? Well, the the Freedmen's Bureau also was assisting poor whites. Because after, like I said, these plantations closed, they, they have nobody else to oversee. So they was in the same bucket all over again. So they took the opportunity when slavery started off and got jobs. But, you know, like I said, lost it when it was over. But they stayed up north. That's we see a lot of New York, New Jersey, uh, Boston, along the Appalachian Trail. You know, those moonshining uh, TV shows people see on TV. They all, you know, started to inhabit those areas. Like in the Appalachians, I mean, that's when I'm from North Carolina. And when I was stationed in Tennessee, one of the things, you, you had to drive through the Appalachian, Asheville, North Carolina to get to there. Yep. And that's one of the places that you don't want to get pulled over at. Right. There's nothing but mountains. You got, there's no gas station for a good 10 miles. You don't want to get caught up in those areas. Yeah. Because a lot of those, you know, that population, the Irish, Scottish folks started to, to you know, become policemen. That's where you see all these fraternal order of police. It's, it's some Scottish guys, some Irish dudes. That's what they kept doing. I mean, that's the profession that they made. They stayed that's in. Why they, 
they, yep. they just made, I mean, basically, so basically they went from being, you know, playing a position during slavery into like kind of playing the same position today within law enforcement, you know, using them to keep some type of, all right, we're going to use them to establish some type of order or enforce our rules or our laws, you know? Absolutely. You got places like uh, Boston and, and um, Chicago. And like you said, New York, where the police forces was predominantly or all Irish. Yep. Yeah. They they stuck with the family business. Yeah. You know, the family business was to look look over and oversee black folks, and that and that's what they did. So, um, but you asked me another question after that. Uh, it was something about Irish. I was asking where they was at during this period of Reconstruction. Well, they, they was in they was in the um, like I said, it was in the Appalachian area. They stayed northward, but um, to go back to um. And pull up that compromise of 1877. You know that that was that was by definition the end of Reconstruction. Those Democrats regained power. They began to defranchise Black folks using um, black codes, using um, Jim Crow laws that the Black folks eventually evolved to. So now it's we were right back into, you know, a position of servitude in the in the you know, at that time. So Jim Crow takes over from that point, the separate but equal. I'm not denying, denying you food because I'm letting you eat in the back. I'm not denying you the ability to come on my train car, but you got to sit all the way in the back of the, uh, the train cars for Negroes, the separate but equal. So, you know, you got your civil rights set in 1875, I believe, in, and then you get your civil rights set in 1964, which pretty much encompasses everything. That's, you know, Martin Luther King pushed for, signed by London B. Johnson. But through, through those years, you see things, success stories, success stories like your Blanche Bruce's, you're hearing your, um, you're hearing your rebels. And also you see things like cities like Haiti, Durham, North Carolina. Now, one of my last shows on I Am Sankofa TV, I talked about Durham and how originally Durham was a black city, predominantly black city. And there was a section of the city called Haiti, H-A-Y-T-I. Mm hmm now they named it they, they named the city after you know the country haiti which was the first sovereign black you know uh country in the western hemisphere so that's what they kind of named it after so in this part of durham you, it's over 200 businesses banks uh funeral homes schools um i think some of the founders found in north carolina central shaw university these are obviously hbcus but this was this is one of the communities that a lot of those freedmen who participated in the Freedmen's Bureau kind of came to this part of North Carolina and started to build, along with Wilmington. I want to say uh, Washington, North Carolina. They started to build there. Um, and I think one of the businesses that came out of it, I don't know if me and you built on it before, but it was um, North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance. Now, to this day, this is one of the oldest, most affluent African-American businesses in U.S. history. And what they specialized in was industrial insurance. It's nothing, it's nothing more but burial insurance. So when they started it, they just trying to collect some money so when loved ones started to pass away, the family could have the money to put them in the ground. Now, if anyone ever buried a family member, you know how much it costs for a burial. All right. You know, you have people passing and having cookouts, passing around a plate to put somebody in the ground. That's ridiculous. We should all have life insurance. Right. That's something I stress a lot, man. Like, that's the issue. Like, you know what? And now that we're talking about this and we're talking about our uh, ancestors and elders, you know, back in the day. Uh, and, you know, we're dealing with them during the time when they were already here in America. Like, my grandmother and my mom and them and my great grandparents, if nothing else, they always made sure they had enough money to put somebody in the ground. They always made sure they had life insurance. I think people back then you know they took that a little more serious than people do today as well as how you mentioned that they had these other groups set up that would actually you know come in and be able to help along with that you know and i think today like we see a lot of people out um 
raising money, like you said, passing around plates and having fish fries and parties at the bar and GoFundMe's. I, I think that's something that needs to be stressed. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, somebody hear you talk about some of the stuff you're talking about and it inspire them to go out and get some life insurance, man, because that, that's a serious thing. You don't want to leave your family with a bunch of debt. And you can pass wealth down that way too. You go get you a, a fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar insurance policy. Right. So when you you can pass that money down to your children because that generational wealth that we were not able to set up. Um, you ever heard the argument of, you know, a, you know, a white person may say, "Oh, my father came over from Italy. He didn't speak English or have any money, but he was able to build this tire company or whatever." But think about it. He was afforded the opportunity to start a company to buy a house. Yeah, something that my great grandfather didn't have the opportunity to do. So you're right. talking about generational wealth that was able to. We was, I mean, you he, he always got a four hundred year head start. So when I hear people say, "Oh, we got to stop playing victim and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps," that's not gonna happen. So let, let, in, in in twenty years, fifty years, so let's talk about you know sixteen oh five until eighteen sixty three. Slavery. All right. All right. From eighteen sixty three to nineteen sixty four, you have Jim Crow, black code. Night, so we so let's just give it nineteen sixty four. That's not that's not a long time at all to to come up from under four hundred years of strict oppression. So the the time frame in itself, where people say, "Oh, it's been four hundred years," like, no, nah, you don't understand. We have to go back and look through history. We really talking about up until nineteen sixty four. Mm hmm. The last lynching was in nineteen sixty five. Damn. And we all know the things that's happened before us to this day. We see black man, Officer Eric Garner, Tamir Rice being shot by the police. It's happening in our face right now. Right, so, right. So, we, yeah, we came a long way, but we still have a, an extremely long way to go. Yeah, yeah, it ain't that easy to just move on. No, uh, it's not, no. And, and, and during this time or during this period, we're talking about people who actually was put out, basically like out in the cold with nothing. Like, you know, like, just, just, that's why I want people to just imagine this. Like, imagine the, the country going to war and they fight and then somebody comes to the property or the plantation and say, all right, y'all free, y'all free to go. Like, where the hell are we going? You feel what I'm saying? So we started from nothing. And that, and that goes to show that the resilience that we have as a people mm -hmm. to go through all, to go through all of the, the atrocities that our ancestors went through and still be in the position we are, we produce an intellect at that time. You understand what I'm saying? Intellects from that time. Yeah. Um, we'll, I will build and do another show of individuals through probably like the 1700s to the early 1900s. I'm talking about chemists, microbi I mean biologists, you know, botanists, you know, Octavius Cotto with the brother on um, True Story and built on the other a couple weeks ago. 32 years old, but look what he was able to do during that time and in 32 years. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you got, you got, uh, what's this? Let me see. You got Blanche Bruce over here. Give us a little bit of, uh, uh, you have mentioned him a few times, but give us a little information on Blanche Bruce. Well, Blanche Bruce. Um, he started, he was actually born into slavery. His, his mother was African and his father was the actual plantation owner. So he was kind of given a little bit more abilities to learn. He was educated in Ohio. Um, he worked in, in Ohio as far as desegregating the area, starting to start schools. Um, he actually held his seat for an entire term, unlike Harry and Rebels, who was kind of he took over a seat because the guy, I want to say his name was Thomas Jefferson. No, it wasn't Thomas Jefferson, but he was kind of pulled out of seat, so Harry Rebels took it. But Blanche Bruce actually held a seat for the entire period. And another third thing about Blanche Bruce is he actually presided over the U.S. Senate. And for some of y'all who, who may not know, that's normally a position held for the vice president of the country. So think about at that time, 1870s, where you have a a black man sitting at the one of the greatest houses in our government, presiding over it. Mm -hmm. So, wow. 
So he said he st- he he started a school. I mean he, he he was he was working in Ohio. I see. Yeah, in Oberlin. I ain't too far from Oberlin. Man, Ober- Oberlin is probably like thirty minutes from where I'm at. If that, maybe forty five minutes. Maybe forty five minutes. Uh, let me see. It also says he. Uh, let me see. Dennis said he re- relocated to Bolivar. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna trip you out about Bolivar. Bolivar is like ten minutes down the highway. <laughs> see, right there. Yeah, Bolivar is like ten minutes. Like if I get on the highway from my house right now, I'll be in Bolivar by it's nine thirty. I'll be there by nine forty. Yep, I'll be there by nine forty. Man, that's crazy. They said it's near, yeah, near Cleveland. That's nuts. Yeah, so I mean, it, you know, it's some, it's some. Um, oh, this is hold on. I think they talking about in um, Mississippi. Yeah, but I do uh, Oberlin. Like I said, Oberlin ain't that far. And it's a college in Oberlin. It's like somebody I know. Went to school in Oberlin. I want to say it was my co- one of my cousin's girlfriends went to school in Oberlin. I think he used to go down there to visit her. And so you see, I he was a landowner. He's a landowner there as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. I think he uh also ran for um vice president at the time. I think he he got a couple of like eight or nine votes actually on the ballot for him. So basically, um, his his uh, legacy uh, basically goes all the way to um, being a, a early uh, African American politician. Absolutely, but coming but coming, you got to think he coming from the paradigm of he coming from the paradigm of having you know the ability to um. Maneuver a little better. Maneuver a little yeah. bit because of who his father was. Right, right, right. You right. see what I'm saying? When Harry and Wells, I mean Harry and Rebels, he kind of had to go at it the, the harder way. Like he was actually born into slavery, you know, worked his way up out of it. I believe he also did some work in Ohio. And I got um, him. And in, and in Mississippi. I got him pulled up too. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um,. Now tell us a little bit about him. I see he was uh, he, so he from Fayette, Fayetteville, North Carolina. That's what's up. They got a uh, historical black college down there, Fayetteville State University. And yep, I see where he was uh, at a Dark County Seminary in Ohio. I know, you know, I know uh, from, oh, he's a part of AME Church, too. Now, I know from doing a lot of this research and doing a lot of this studying with y'all, you know what I mean? Like, the Carolinas, both north and south, Ohio, uh, basically Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as well as New York. But uh, when we talk about, when we study this, the, the, the states that come up the most, or Virginia, too, I can't forget Virginia. The states that come up the most is like, or cities is Philadelphia, Ohio, particularly like uh, Cincinnati, and uh, North and South Carolina and Virginia. Those five places come up a lot when we do this information. Yeah, I would say like Philadelphia is definitely, Philadelphia and New York are definitely some of the important, important places. You know, that's when you see the statue. Um, I want to say it's all all colored war memorial statue. Uh huh. Octavius Cotto. He you know so he was around there so definitely moving. Now you ain't got to go real deep into it, but tell the people a little bit about um, why you feel like uh, and I mean I'm a, you know I'm gonna be in agreement with you, but why uh, why we both are you know agreeing that Philadelphia 
it's one of the important uh, places during this time or during the time after uh, blacks were free. I think even before then, but you know, go ahead and break that down a little bit. I mean, with Philadelphia, you see, in, in my opinion, you see a lot of AME churches. You see a lot of black church institutions. Um, a lot of great leaders are coming out of those organizations and taking leadership roles. You know, at, at the time, you know, Philadelphia was a very important city, period, in America. So you're going to make your greatest effect in a city that has that type of life. So a brother like Octavius Collar can get his shine, you know. But in, in my opinion, personally, I want to say it's a you had a large concentration of black churches, black institutions that was there. And they was raising men and women to be productive. And to get involved in their com communities, to go out and vote, to go to school and get educated. Not saying that's the end all be all, but to go out and strive to. Because every time, let's say if if a, if, if a European go one yard, we got to go 10 yards to make up the time that we lost during those 400 years of, you know, slavery. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So Philadelphia is, in a, is an important city in America, period. It just so happened that a lot of our, mu our movements as far as our community building, nation building happened there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of shocked me when I, you know, everything was leading back to Philadelphia or like, you know, you'll see these movements of people who making these um, journeys from the South to the North. And a lot of times they ended up in, in the, in Philadelphia or like, you know, even if they were a part of these different organizations and groups, like the big, uh, you know, like if they have an annual meeting or some type of conference, it seemed like it would, you know, end up being in uh, Philadelphia. You know, I mean, we joke around and say the city of brotherly love, but when I think of the city of brotherly love, you know what I mean? And I think about history, then I'm thinking about, you know, black people uh, converting, right. conversion on the uh, streets of Philadelphia. Yeah, definitely dope. I mean, ain't like, ain't like I said, I know you know, in my own my own chat, so whatever dealing with my, my partners that I got here with, around me, you know, in the city, you know, they don't like when I bring up the church. I mean, they have a real disdain in which I understand it. I don't knock it. I understand why you feel the way you feel. But the one thing we can't deny is the organization that came with this institution. Don't worry about the, the, the Bible stuff. Just think about it. The organization you, is undeniable. You see what I'm saying? If you're not out here moving within your local community, voting, I know down in Atlanta, in my county, Forsyth, we got a couple of elections coming up for some uh, county commissioner, the Board of Education. So for those who listen to who are in my area, I recommend you hop on the website. They got all the candidates there, all their bios, you know, and pick accordingly. I was because that that mayor you mad at. Uh -huh. That lead prosecutor, you we mad at for not sentencing somebody. That sheriff, we not mad at for pressing them charges. They up for election right now. You know, and, I, and we go ahead. I was uh, just talking to uh, Chris today. It's about to be election time. Uh, what is it? This this week. You know, people are gonna be voting here locally on local issues, and I know it's gonna be some you know things going on across the uh, country locally. And uh, this is like the first year that I really haven't. I really don't know what's on the what's on the ballot, so I gotta do some researching on that tonight before I go to sleep. I really don't know. I know we got a couple uh, brothers and sisters that's running for city council. Uh, the one sister's running for council at large, which would be dope if she can get that. But other than that, though, uh, that's all I really know about. It's a couple oh, issues. And that's another takeaway from that period. Mm -hmm. You had, like, we start, we were involved in it. Started making changes, getting our laws on the books. Now, we, you know, we know that those laws ultimately were taken off because of, you know, the Compromise of 1877 and other things, the betrayals. But we seen how effectively we could move when we was in that kind of unit and that type with that type of mindset. But we got here, we started changing who these local officials are. We can start to really affect change. We don't have to worry about going out in the street protesting. Because we know we got somebody up in there that's going to lean our way when it's time to make these decisions. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So it's we, the opportunity is here. I think 
what's crazy, I think there's a show on ABC. Uh, it's called The Mayor. It's about a, a black dude that's the mayor now. Yeah, I've seen the uh, previews for that one day. Uh, An uh, ad ran across somewhere. I might have been watching TV or something. And I seen the uh, uh, app or or, the, or uh, commercial for that. It's a young dude, right? A young brother, ain't it? Yeah, it's a young brother, and like his his team, his staff is all young. But you, I, mean, I don't know who I did was, but I think it's from the creator of Blackish. But you know, it's a young brother who ran just to, as a joke and got elected. Wow. You know? I yeah. mean, it's it's another option. You know, just another option. If we if we want to see some change quickly, is to get out get our people in these offices, so we don't have to worry about having situations when the justice system don't go our way. Right, right. Damn, man, this this is so much. It's so much going on, man. It's hard to keep up with it all, man. But like I said, I know you've been really you, Jay, Joseph, and you know y'all been building real good, Giselle. Y'all been building real good in the uh, back chat and, and and staying on top of this uh, topic. I think I yeah, want to say like you know, Danny keep you sharp. You know I I keep it honest. You know true story and he keep you sharp. So you know I'm I'm definitely not the be all. And I'm not saying he is, but my go to guy is true story. Yeah, I was gonna say basically. Uh, other than y'all, he the only person that's really dealing with this uh, time period. You know what I mean? So I think it's a breath of fresh air for the people who kind of getting lost. And, you know, like, oh, I'm tired of hearing, uh, you know, they want to hear something different. You know what I'm saying? So I think it give them a, some, you know, another option when we talk about our history or something else to listen to or something else to study. Right. Like our only glory days ain't Kim. You know, our glory days ain't, you know, denial, though I love it mm -hmm. dearly because without it, I probably wouldn't be here. But we have answers that we can reach to that's 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Some that are still alive today right now that we can reach to and get and get guided from or, yep. or to get some, find some type of plans from. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it made good sense to, like, try to cover, like, you know, we try to cover or, you know what I mean? Every, everybody don't need to cover the same, you know, area all the time. And, you know, we kind of talked about that with the channel and stuff, like, you know, doing some different things with YouTube and stuff, you know, not oversaturating the uh, the, the um, viewers with this too much of the same thing, you know, so give them something a little different. Yeah, and just the avenue, like, you know, like I said, I was telling you before we started, I'm not here to be anybody... Um, teacher or anything. I just want to provide somebody with the information and then spark the the idea for you to go look it up for yourself. And then we can come back and build on it. You know, some real some real study group stuff. Yeah. You know, we we somebody pick a topic, you get a week to a week or two weeks to look it up and then we come together and build on it. And then we, we can start writing that down. We start having minutes. Then we can start cataloging it, writing books about it. You see what I'm saying? To really get our ideas on paper so when it's time for us to go away from here, we got some literature to pass down. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, man. So, um, anything else you want to add to uh, what you had with the build? No, um, only thing is, this is just, you know, part one or a brief introductory. Um, introduction to it, you know, I'm gonna probably come back later on for part uh, two, three, or whatever, whatever, you know what I'm saying, you, you, you're thinking about that you want to get into um, when it comes down to the to the knowledge. So, just just to see the, the good things and the bad things, the pros and cons that happened during this period, go take a look at it for yourself, go look at, you know, the 13th, the 14th, and, and 15th amendments, and how those three amendments all came in like a, a small 10-year period. Right. And, it were, and it were all of them were step forwards. They were all step forwards. The, the Civil Rights Act 1875 was a step forward. You know, now we in 2017. So there was there was no point in time when we weren't fighting. I want to make that understood to the people. Nobody was sitting there crying and feeling victimized. There was no point in time when we weren't fighting. And the history there to, to show us that we weren't. If anybody want to take anything from this, you know what I mean? Take this from the bill. All right, no doubt, no doubt.
Yeah, well, shit. You know, at the end of the day, anytime you get ready, y'all, you know how to get in contact with me. Just hit me up. And, uh, you know, we can make it happen. Come over here and build. Uh, Six Dynasty Media be back up and running. We was talking about that. It'll be back up and running. I want to say December. I thought I, I think it's December 6th. I thought about it. It got to be December 6th. <laughs> it's going to have to be. But I, I know for sure, and we definitely going to take that, take off with that platform. I'm going to do some different stuff with it. But one of the things I'm going to do over there is bring forth, uh, uh, well, give it a, give people a platform to bring forth uh, information and presentations and stuff like that. So yeah, we're going to get back to them uh, Nova Scotia bills and the, the road to Sierra Leone and Liberia. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But um, for those who don't, I mean, if you want, follow me on my YouTube channel. I am Sankofa TV. I appreciate the support from Brother Amadi for bringing me on. You know, good work over here, Six Donnie, and salute to you, brother. All right, peace. Yeah, I appreciate it. Peace. All right, all right peace to the fam. Yeah. All right, family. So, y'all already know what it is. We're doing the... Uh, that's a dope build by the brother. A lot of information in there. Uh, one of the things that I want to make sure everybody is aware of is the t-shirt giveaway. Because I see some people that just came in the building. And they probably don't know that I'm doing a t-shirt giveaway. Um, so what I need people to do is email. Oh, and we reached uh, we reached the number of uh, subscribers we need over here too. That was dope. Uh, we doing a, a t-shirt giveaway. Let me see who in the chat room get some shout outs real quick. Uh, Marcel, that was brother. Uh, if you still if you still here listening, that was brother uh, Sineb from uh, Sankofa TV. You can go subscribe to him. Shout out to John Doe. What's up with you, fam? Uh, Uprise, peace, candy kisses. What's going on with you? All the way to Tennessee. You already know what it is. Um, T Duck. 415, I seen you in the building. Um, Nikki Justice, um, My Two Loves, Giselle, I see you was in the building. I see you was in the building, uh, Jay, Michael Phillips, um, Marty Baby, Marty Baby, Tamara Davidson. Uh, that's an old, that's the bad last stream. Yeah, so yeah, if you want to enter into the t shirt. Thing, all you got to do is go ahead and grab that email, 6 Media at gmail.com. You can get your shirts. Um, just send an email. I'll give you a number. December 1st. I should have done on the 6th because that's the day that 6 Dynasty Media opens back up. But December 1st is when um, I'll have those, uh, I have the uh, drawing. So we, I'll announce the winners that day. All right. So, yeah, like I said, dope build. Um, I'm going to let this, let the beat build on this one real sweet. Make sure y'all go check out that last stream that we did too. That was a good, that was a good stream. Uh, definitely was a good stream. I'm going to start doing it like that. How you learn something new every day? Learn something new every day. <laughs> All right, family. Um, I don't know if I'll be back live again um, tonight or not. What's up, Triple Triple OG Darkness? It's lit. What's good with you, fam? I don't know if I'll be doing another build tonight. Let me check my email and see what I got going on, fam. I think this is this might be it for the night. I did want to do some other news because the crazy part about it is um, I just seen something. Let me see. Let me see. I just seen something come across my um, notifications that was kind of crazy. On the hip hop side, so yeah, I think I'm about to do this. I'm about to do this uh, hip hop news over on uh, Six Dynasty Reloaded real quick, and then um, and that's gonna be a short stream. 
and then I'm going to go ahead and uh, call it. All right. So peace to the family. See y'all shortly. I should be doing that build real quick. And then this, that's it for the night. Lights out. Peace. Struggling, got off my ass, sent the trap right back, hustling.